Thank you, everybody, for being so flexible this morning. <laughs> Ready in season and out of season? That's what the good book says. Let's bow our hearts and hone in on the Lord. Father, Abba, we draw our hearts to you, Lord. You're our joy. You're our protector, our tower, strong deliverer. Our hearts draw to you, and we just want to say thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the Savior. Thank you for sending your Son. And Lord, just for watching him suffer everything he did for your people. Thank you for releasing him to the earth and exalting him back to the heavens. And we just give you praise and honor this morning. And I thank you also that for giving us the Holy Spirit. We just thank you, Holy Trinity, for everything you are doing for your people. And Lord, I ask for a special measure of your Spirit this morning. As I preach and teach, I take authority and bind every unclean spirit from this place. I command you to leave by the blood of the Lamb. Lord, give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation, counsel and might, knowledge and a fear of the Lord. I'm asking for the sevenfold Holy Spirit to come. Holy Spirit, come in your fullness this morning. We want to learn about you because Jesus said you are a most precious gift to us. And so, Lord, we bow our hearts and we want to search your word for truth because your word is truth. And I thank you so much, Lord. Strengthen me in my inward frame with concentration and focus, Lord. And make the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart a blessing to your people this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, for those of you who are just catching up and you've been away for a little bit on holiday, uh, the last couple of Sundays I was preaching on what it is to go through a season of mourning and how the Lord has given us the Holy Spirit as a comforter. He is our comforter, our advocate, parakletos, the one we call near, is the Greek meaning of the word. And I, I believe the Lord wanted me to finish the thought this morning about the Holy Spirit. Just keep focusing in on the Holy Spirit, that we might understand the relationship we walk in with Him. In the last two Sundays, we've been talking about how He comforts us. But as you know, with relationships, it's a two-way street. And we also have the power to grieve the Holy Spirit or to gratify Him by our behavior and the way we receive him into our lives and love him and honor him. And so we're going to look at uh, the Holy Spirit and our response to him with our behavior today. Let's uh, start with an opening story from the Gospels. John, uh, the first chapter, turn to uh, verse 43 to 47. John 1, 43 to 47. Let's make it sure I got the right. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. And he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. He's in the process of choosing his disciples. Now, Philip was from Bethesda, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. 
In the early days of Jesus' ministry, when his disciples were still um, being chosen and sort of found, Jesus meets Nathanael. And when he sees him, he perceives by the Holy Spirit that Daniel, uh, Nathanael has a certain characteristic of personality that makes him stand out from the crowd. Nathanael is a what-you-see-is-what-you-get kind of guy. You can sense the Lord's delight as he speaks about that. An Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. And the word guile there is the Greek word doulos. And it means this range of meaning. Deceit, falsehood, error, trickery. It's actually the word for a bait or a trap that's laid on the ground. And it means when someone practices cunning or wile or manipulation, it's the intentional misleading or beguiling of another. Someone who tries to gain advantage by, or position by deceiving others or using devious or underhanded methods. It's the original Greek Trojan horse. It looks like a gift, but it's really trouble. And that's, that's the nature of doulos, or guile, or deceit. And when Jesus looks at Nathaniel, he's got a quality that l the Lord loves when he looks at it. And Peter, talking about Jesus in the first book of Peter, 2.22, was quoting from Isaiah 53 where it's talking about the Lamb of God. And he says, and it says this, no guile was found on his lips. No guile was found on Jesus' mouth. He never used it. He did not use any form of darkness or trickery or manipulation in his preaching, his teaching, his healing, or his life. It was not in him. He did not have any ulterior motive. He did not use flattery or false promises or outright lies in anything he did. He was true in his source, pure in his motive, and dependable in his method. And we are called to be those people in whom there is no guile. And that's easier said than done. What we're really talking about here is the word, the English word, integrity. And it means to be whole, to be sound, to have all the parts needed. Deceit, guile, and all the things that go along with it are the enemies of integrity. Sincerity, simplicity, and generosity that characterize the Lord Jesus Christ. And you may have noticed over the last few months that I have not been preaching the large broad, great issues of theology and the foundations of our faith. Uh, you are a body of believers, Amisk, that have a very solid foundational understanding of the Word of God, and most of you are on the internet and reading books and up on Christian music, and you are God chasers. And you are well aware of these foundational things, and you're very motivated. And so what the Lord has had me emphasize instead are the issues of practical spirituality. How to take the great uh, theology, put shoes on it, and walk it out the door. And in this little while especially, we've been dwelling on attitude and words. And there's a reason for that. I believe we are entering as we come into the season of the bride, there is an outpouring of anointing. There is an outpouring of prophetic ability. And the gifts of the church are going to come so heavy and so strong that if we do not have words and attitudes under control, the revival that God wants to bring will be corrupted by the guile that's still in our hearts. We've, there's been lots of revivals that have had great beginnings, but then they derail. Why? Because of the flesh. 
And so the Lord, there, I believe that there's a door of grace that is closing over these issues of behavior and speaking. And we need to start really believing that death and life are in the power of the tongue. And we need to stop speaking death. And so the Holy Spirit, it just keeps me pressed down on this issue. And when the Lord was teaching me about the fine line of words and in the fine line of my conscience, he used a particular word. He used the word scruple. He said, I want that clean right down to the last scruple. Now, scruple is kind of an old-fashioned word. What it actually is, um, is one twenty-fourth of an ounce. It's a measurement of a weight. And, or the weight of 20 grains. It's an apothecary's measurement. It's the measurement, uh, they don't use it anymore, but it used to be used for the making of medicine. And the reason the Lord said this to me about the scruple is uh, because before the formation of electronic scales, the weights of the apothecary were the finest measurement you could get. And they use substances in medicine that are so powerful, two grains will heal you, but six grains will kill you. And the Lord wants us to be a people who understand the fine line scruples, not just milk drinkers, but meat eaters, who've had our faculties trained to distinguish between good and evil. The Lord is looking to his people because every time we ask for new levels of anointing, we need new levels of consecration. We need new levels of purity. An increased level of power requires a higher level of purity. And the Lord wants to deal with these little foxes that ruin the vineyard. And lots of it has to do with words. And the area of words is beginning to receive microscopic attention from the Lord. We are going to be working with anointings so potent. We need to understand down to the last scruple. If you will purpose your heart, the Lord will give you that level of wisdom. Because let's just talk about the power of the word of God. Let's go to uh, 2 Corinthians 3. 6 to 9, because the Word of God is a very, very potent substance. And we are called to be workmen that rightly handle. In fact, the Greek says rightly divide the Word of God and use it properly. So 2 Corinthians 3, 6 to 9, it's talking about God who has made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds it much more in glory. It's talking about the two parts there are to the word of God. The Old Testament, the law, is the letter that kills. Why is it? Because it brings a knowledge of sin. That's the killing power of the Old Testament. It makes us aware of our sin. Where there's no law, there's no sin. That's what Romans 5.5 5 says. And so the Old, the Old Testament, not just the whole Old Testament, but especially the law of Moses, Paul describes it as a dispensation of death. Those are strong words. He describes it as the ministration of gloom or condemnation. The word has the power to kill flesh because of God's holiness. 
When we compare ourselves to the holy standard, that's what happens. But it doesn't stop there. The Spirit gives life. And we have come into the new chapter. Because when Jesus came, he fulfilled all these demands, demands, demands of the law we couldn't meet that were killing us. So the Spirit gives life. And we're on that part of the dispensation of grace. But isn't it interesting that God didn't lop off the Old Testament? We've still got it all in one book. And we're supposed to take it and use it together. Because if we don't understand what sin is, grace doesn't mean anything. So God has kept these two parts together. And that's, that is a mystery. And it's part of the discipline of godliness to learn how to walk in that paradox. In order to understand the power of the gospel and everything that Jesus has done for us, we have to understand the law. So it's necessary to know and teach both parts of the word. The letter that kills and the spirit that gives life. If you don't understand you're a sinner, you won't feel the need for a savior. The word of God has the power to work both life and death in the power of a person. It's a very potent substance and it can be either medicinal or poisonous. Just like a lot of other substances. Proverbs 18.21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they who indulge in it shall eat the fruit of it. And we do not want to be a people who take the word of God and beat other people over the head of, with it. Because the scripture says it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. And yet tr the truth is the truth. So somewhere between those two par paradoxes, we need the Holy Spirit to guide us. We are spiritual creatures. Remember we talked last week about how do you enter the spiritual realm? You enter it with words. That is how the spiritual realm is activated in our lives. So we need to think, which realm am I activating with my words? Are my words of faith? Or are they of fear? Let's go to James 3, 5 to 15. It tells us a little bit about words about the tongue. James 3, 5. Um, 5, we won't go all the way to 15. We'll just go to 8. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue so set among our members that it defiles the whole body, sets on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile, creature of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. That's natural man. That's not redeemed man. But there's great potential in the tongue. But this is the part that's interesting. No man can tame the tongue. Well, if we can't tame the tongue, what are we going to do? God can tame the tongue. The spirit that is within the person runs the tongue. In the last two sessions, we've been talking about grieving. Now, because we have a relationship with him, let's talk about what grieves the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is deeply grieved by both guile and deceit and treachery and all that goes with that present in the heart. But he's also grieved when it comes out of the mouth. And I would like to uh, give you a little bit of uh, homework for the coming week because it's a chunk of scripture that's just too big for us to tackle in 45 minutes. Would you sometime this week read Ephesians chapter 4 and 5 and see if you can find all seven 
kinds of speaking that grieve the Holy Spirit. There's seven kinds. See if you can find all seven. Because we don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. Because when the Holy Spirit is grieved, he withdraws, and then we can't, we don't feel him near. Even though he, he is near, we just don't feel him. We need to repent of these ways. We grieve him. And there are also, as is described in James 3, there are some demonic entities that are very, very interested in controlling the tongue. And two of them are described in Acts 16. So let's go there so that we, in evil we be babes, but in thinking we be mature. There are enemies of the Holy Spirit who want to counterfeit what he does. So let's be wise. Acts 16. Verse 16. Now it happened, and they're in Philippi. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by soothsaying or divination. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. To, uh, I, I've said two, um, the scriptures describe it as one, I think it's a, it, it is one spirit, but he, he works two different ways. We're going to look at it. Paul had an encounter in Philippi with some of the most powerful demonic entities he ever encountered. And these two are identified in scripture as the spirit of Python and the spirit of divination. Now, um, the first, most translations don't um, say actually spirit of Python, but in the Greek, that's the literal spirit of Python. And these are the demonic counterfeits to the Holy Spirit in the whole area of the prophetic. The oracular and anything concerning the will of God, they try to counterfeit it and draw others into the demonic instead of into the holy. And the mandate of the Holy Spirit is to fill the church with gifts of power and sharp, strong, prophetic unction. Their mandate is to quench, undermine, and finally strangle the life of the church by replacing it with error and religious tradition of dead rules and formulas. And notice that this spirit attacked them as they went to the place of prayer. And the Python spirit, it, it's actually, uh, this, Paul is talking about the spirit that the Greeks used to talk about when there, there was an oracle of uh, um, Apollo up at Delphi on the high hill. And there was a snake that you would wrap itself around when they would come up the hill for the oracle to receive it from the demonic, because, of course, all idols are really the worship of demons. And so he's talking about that actual spirit, that snake spirit, and it acts like a python. It closes around and constricts until it suffocates. And that's exactly how it operates in the church. These spirits attack those going to a place of prayer or to seek the Lord, they attack the God chasers. And those who have a sincere heart and faith and are earnestly seeking spiritual gifts and an authentic spiritual experience. And they try to rival and displace the work of the Holy Spirit. It, um, the Python spirit also can twist the word of God as a tool to bring fear, condemnation, and guilt that paralyzes the believer. The python spirit attacks you, you in your conscience. And it speaks the words of God to you falsely to put 
fear and condemnation to hedge you in so that you're scared to do anything. It, it directly attacks the prophetic unction in prayer and ministry. And there's a second component to this spirit. It's the component of soothsaying. That's an old-fashioned word, and it appears in the Old Testament in the story of Balaam. And if you want to do a little more research on the soothsaying spirit, that is in Numbers 22, 23, and 24. It will give you great insight. And what the soothsaying spirit does is it counterfeits the prophetic. Sooth, the word sooth actually means truth. It is, trying, it, it, it is trying to pass off occult as truth to you, but also there's something even a little more scary. It, the, Satan knows the word of God probably better than we do. And he knows how to twist it. And he, this spirit can actually take the word of God and what is truth and use it against believers. It works in conjunction with the python, and it always tries to kill Jesus, to kill the anointing, to kill the life in the church, and to kill the work of the Holy Spirit. And these are real, and they know how to speak the truth, but use it as a weapon for darkness. And we need to have our eyes open and be aware. And Paul wrestled. Did you notice in this passage it says, and this she did many days. So you look at that scripture and you say, well, what's the problem with this girl? She's running around telling everybody these are the servants of the Most High God. And they're proclaiming the way of salvation. But do you understand that every time she did that, she interrupted Paul's preaching. She interrupted it and brought confusion. But it took Paul a little while, or else the Holy Spirit restrained him. We don't really know. But it says, this went on many days. Some of this stuff is hard to discern. It takes a while dealing with it, even for Paul, apparently. And you know, it's present. The, the um, spirit that ran the Pharisees was the spirit of Python and divination, to make up as many new little rules as we can and quench and hold and control. And there's an example of it, um, a profound example in John 11, verse 49. The high priest is talking. And the scripture says that he is talking because he has a prophetic gift. But he says, don't you know that it is needful that one should die instead of the, uh, for the whole nation? And he's talking about Jesus. And he's actually prophesying the death of Jesus but in his heart, he has hatred. He has a murderous hatred for the Lord Jesus to kill him. Not prophesying from the Holy Spirit, but from Python and a soothsaying spirit. And so how, how, Lord, are we going to know the difference when the truth is spoken? Well, the scripture gives us a clue. It says, speak the truth in love. Ephesians 4. These things are very serious, very real, and even a little frightening. How can we discern whether these spirits are present and influential in our lives? By what Jesus said in Matthew 7. He said this, beware of the false prophets, or I'm going to put in there occult counterfeits, who come to you dressed as sheep, but inside they're devouring wolves. You will fully recognize them by their fruits. Do people pick grapes from thorns or figs from thistles? Even so, every healthy tree bears good fruit, but sickly, worthless trees bear bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, neither can a bad tree bear excellent fruit. Therefore, you will fully know them by their fruits. The fruits of character are the words that come out of your mouth and the, and the environment you build around you with your words. And the way these spirits gain power is through words. So we need to ask ourselves as we're speaking, we need to balance bold, faith-filled speaking 
against using our words, as Jesus said, you'll give account for every idle word you speak, against words that are um, led by the Spirit. Remember when um, the disciples, uh, someone was speaking against Jesus, and the disciples said, should we call down fire from heaven? And Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you're speaking of. There's another example right there. He, because they were speaking of the spirit of Satan, the accuser. The accuser of the brethren. Or diabolos. You know the word we use for devil means? Slanderer. Traitorous informer. We need to be careful. And even with our speech, we're our brother's keeper. And God requires us to walk in covenant with the power of our words. So let's just look at one particular kind of speaking that manifests guile. How can you tell if guile is present in the heart, especially in the church? Because we don't run around defrauding each other, running bad deals. It can't be overt so it becomes covert through our words. And one of the main problems in the church that way is gossip. The spirit of Diabolos and the, the slanderer and Satan, the accuser, runs through gossip. In Leviticus 19.16, in the law, it says this, You shall not go up and down as a dispenser of gossip and scandal among your people, you, nor shall you secure yourself by false testimony and silence and endanger the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. Direct command. Second Timothy two fifteen to seventeen. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they increase more and more unto ungodliness, and their word will devour like cancer. Gossip is the cancer of the church. It's the gangrene, the flesh-eating disease. It kills joy, it kills fellowship, and it kills li the life of Christ in the church. And you know, if you confront a gossiper sometime, what they might say to you is this, I'm just telling the truth. Maybe they are. But in what spirit? We're called to handle the truth in a certain way. Because why? The word is so powerful, it kills or it gives life. Which one are we living in? We're to speak the truth in love and expose the difference between a spirit of soothsaying and a person moved by the Holy Spirit. So how will you know when you cross the line? Like we're not supposed to just shut up and say nothing. Our words have power and, and God wants us to use them. So the measure, what is the measurement in the spirit when you've crossed the line between social information, you know, just talking with someone in a civilized manner, and when you go into gossip? How do you know the difference? We need to watch for um, very refined forms of evil in speaking. When, when you're talking with someone, how do you feel in your spirit when that conversation is finished? Do you feel nauseous and disturbed and discouraged? These are signs that the Holy Spirit within you is grieved at the words. And he's not testifying that he agrees with the truth of them. The scripture says, test the spirits whether they are of God. Is the spirit of the accuser of the brethren present or the slanderer? Remember that your words can attract or detract someone to that person. Are, am I creating prejudice and bias for someone because of the way I speak? You know, you don't actually have to say anything, that person is terrible or that person's done this and this. You can speak of them in such a way that creates a bias. And when the person goes away, they'll say, well, hmm, I think I'll stay away from that person even though you haven't said really one bad thing. These are very fine lines. 
And remember the hearsay evidence rule. Remember, in human courts, when the, when the witness comes up to the stand and the, the lawyer said, d says, what did you hear about this? And, and they'll say, well, my friend told me that this is what happened. And the lawyer for the defense will stand up and say, objection, hearsay evidence. What does that mean? The person who is testifying was not present when the actual event happened. They just heard about it. Hearsay evidence is not permissible in human courts. It is most certainly not permissible in spiritual ones. If you don't have first-hand witness to an event or conversation, be careful. And remember the hearing both sides of the story rule from Proverbs 18? Because in gossip, you're really only hearing one side of the story, aren't you? And it's not a just scale or measurement. And remember the two or three witnesses rule. That comes from Deuteronomy 17. It says that on the testimony of two or three witnesses shall a matter be established. Don't be quick to believe the worst about anyone. Make sure, especially if there's a formal charge involved, you need more than one witness. Proverbs 26, 24 says, He who hates pretends with his lips, but stores up deceit within himself. When he speaks kindly, do not trust him, for seven abominations are in his heart. Whew. He who hates stores up guile. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. Hatred in the heart, out the mouth. So we need to be careful when we're sharing things about who we're talking to and what's in the heart of the receiver. Because even if your heart is pure, their heart might not be. Don't feed the beast that's looking for dirt. Because sometimes people have offense against that other person, so maybe it's better just not to talk about them at all with that person. Are there old wounds or history of offense? Then maybe you shouldn't be discussing it with them. 1 Corinthians 13, 7 says this, Love bears up under anything and everything that comes is ever ready to believe the best of every person. Its hopes are fadeless under all circumstances, and it endures everything without weakening. I chose this scripture because it says that love is ever ready to believe the best. It, that's the heart of our Father. He's not quick to find fault, take offense, or believe the worst. And our attitude shouldn't be like that either. The love of God is great. It is magnanimous, and it covers a multitude of sins. It's not petty, and it doesn't nitpick about every little thing. And maybe we ought to think about, if I, have, if I think something is wrong in the life of that person, do I have enough conviction from the Holy Spirit to just go right to them and say it? Because if I don't, I probably shouldn't be saying it behind their back. If you find yourself relishing a bad report about someone and even saying, I'm not even surprised to hear that, ask yourself, where is that attitude coming from? Has this person done something to offend me or am I just prejudiced and biased against them without a good reason? Just Sometimes you just don't get along with people because your personalities don't mesh together. But that's no reason to believe the worst of them. Proverbs 11.13 says, The wise and trustworthy keep the matter quiet. When you hear gossip around a certain person or course of events, counteract the firestorm of the enemy with a backburn of intercession we could get Rick up today to give us firefighting tips. I bet one of the things he teaches us is about the, the laying down a back burn. And, you know, when the fire is coming, sometimes the strategy of the fireman is to start a fire strip so it burns up all the uh, fuel and the fire can't jump any further. It stops it. Intercession can do that. 
it can lay down a fire strip to help stop the gossip. And especially if it's against you and the charges are unjust. I, I just go to the prayer closet. I find every scripture I can find concerning the situation. And I just petition heaven and lay down a back burn. And say, I call it ended in Jesus' name. And you can do that on behalf of other people who are being victimized. Lay down a back burn in the spirit. Pray for them. Let your conscience be your guide. And sometimes we don't even say anything that's really negative or from a bad spirit. But we can expose people by what we say to, to the censure of others. Sometimes, you know, you come away from a conversation saying, did I say more than I should have? Did I let slip more than I should have? And if you feel that way, just repent and say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, just cover that person right now. Cover that person with your blood and don't let anything I've said go any further and create problems for them. Just cut it off, Lord, in Jesus' name. Because sometimes we're just not as discreet as we ought to be. And then we think about it later and go, perhaps I shouldn't have done that. Just pray for them. Ask the Lord to remove the consequence of your sin. Sometimes you've got to take a Forrest Gump attitude. And that's all I got to say about that. Sometimes you got to take a thumper attitude. Anyone know the thumper attitude? If you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Sometimes just listening and keeping your mouth shut until you have enough data to form a solid conclusion is the better way to handle it. And, and the scripture gives us a good rule of thumb in James 1, verse 19. It says this, Understand, beloved brethren, let every man be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Proverbs 17, 9 says, He who covers a transgression seeks love, but whoever repeats a matter separates friends. The words of a talebearer and gossip do incredible damage, and they create a deep wounding in the heart of the person, in the heart of the victim, and they even have the potential to separate the closest of friends. And we know that's true. We've seen it, haven't we? It's better to take a stand that incurs a little wrath and makes you look like a fool for a while than let the snakes run rampant. What do I mean by that? Sometimes if someone's in a conversation and it turns to gossip, just say, I don't want to talk about that anymore. I think that's, you know, that feels like gossip to me. And just, boom, put a stop to it right there. And even if you don't handle it in the most diplomatic way, it's, it still makes a strike for righteousness, and it's better to take a stand than to do nothing. Take a chance. And naturally defend the absent person. Change the subject deliberately and pointedly. Or else directly confront that person. Because especially if it's a repeating pattern. Happened more than once. Say, you know what? Sister, I think you've got some offense in your heart against that person. Why don't you take it into your prayer closet and deal with that. Ask the Lord what's going on there. You and the, Maybe you and the Lord need to talk about that. The scripture says, have nothing to do with the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. And you'll see that in Ephesians 4 and 5. Let it be known by your attitude or your words, you're not going to tolerate gossip in your presence. You're not going to tolerate that spirit. It says, Proverbs 22.10, cast out the scoffer and contention will cease. Yes, and strife and reproach will cease. There's a cost to being a firewall and taking a stand against negative speaking. But it's worth it. You may have to suffer the gossiper's displeasure, but let me tell you something. They'll sure think twice about what they say in your presence next time. We need to protect people who are being victimized by gossip and take a stand for righteousness the way Jesus did. Remember when the woman caught in adultery, they 
threw her down in his midst. And they were firing the truth at him. It was true what they were saying about that woman. But he protected. He, uh, he actually saved her life that day. And protected and defended her. And that's the spirit of Jesus. And if you're a victim of gossip, it's really, really hard to do, but most of the time, silence is the best strategy against a firestorm of words, gossip, and accusation. Don't give fuel to the fire. Act with integrity. Consider the accusation. Repent if it's true or if it's partly true, and lay it before the Lord. When you respond to gossip, and you're responding in a spirit of vengeance, Remember, the scripture says vengeance belongs to the Lord. So it's probably better to say nothing. Proverbs 26, 20, where there's no wood, the fire goes out. Where there's no tail bearer, strife ceases. So let's talk about integrity and proper speech. Proverbs 22, 11 says this, whoever loves purity and is pure in heart, because of the grace of his lips, he will have the king for his friend. Do you want the king for your friend? Not just your savior, but your friend. Close, intimate. Don't grieve him with your words. Be gracious. And the problem with... Um, our mouths not being clean. You know, James 3 talks about a spring can't give forth brackish water and fresh. The trouble is if, if your mouth is giving forth brackish water, you disqualify yourself for the prophetic. You disqualify yourself for your own promotion. He wants to entrust you with the secrets and the power of the kingdom. And if your mouth is under control, he can and in fact, the scripture says in James, if you go on reading that James 3 passage, that whoever controls his mouth controls his whole life. Wow. In 2 Corinthians 10, Paul is talking to the Corinthians and he says, Now I, Paul, myself am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. That's Jesus, meek and gentle. We know he's strong. We know he's smart with words. But in his heart, he's gentle. And he's humble and he's meek. And another way to uh, interpret that is clemency. Do you know what clemency is? It's when somebody deserves punishment for something they've done. And someone says, no, he's not going to get that. I'll get, and they give him a lesser sentence or no sentence. That's clemency. The Lord Jesus is very clement with us. We deserve. We, we deserve things and we never get them. Why? Because of the mercy of Jesus and his clemency. So let's be that way to each other. There's so much grace in the Lord. So much grace in him. He's so gracious to us. Even when we grieve the Holy Spirit. But I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit anymore. Let your words be full of humility, meekness, not reactive to others. Jesus says this, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You'll be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak. For it will be given to you in that very hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks through you. The Spirit of your Father. Let's let the Spirit of our Father speak through us. He's speaking life. He's speaking grace. He's speaking goodness. He's speaking forgiveness. He's speaking mercy. Psalm 20, 32, 3, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, 
and in whose spirit there is no guile. So, Father, I pray that as we talk about this today, we would be aware of what is in our spirit, what is coming out of our mouth, and we would speak with your spirit, O God. Father, I pray you would redeem our mouths. Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus, for those in their heart who are saying, I am afflicted, the, the spirit of Python has been afflicting me and just constricting the life of God out of me and pounding condemnation upon me. Lord, we just take authority over that spirit in Jesus' name, and I command you by the blood of Jesus to release them immediately. Release their conscience. Release their mind. And take, their, take your hands off them, Python. And those who are suffering, um, being uh, tormented by a soothsaying spirit, Lord, I rebuke that spirit in Jesus' name. And we choose, Father, to be a holy people led by your Holy Spirit. Help us to be wise. Wise about these things, oh God. Because they're so subtle. Let us speak life, Lord. By your power. Lead us, oh God. Holy Spirit, we want to please you and gratify you. And so we ask you to lead us. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You know what, let's um, close with hymn 57. I think it's Trust and Obey. Let's sing that hymn.